Okay, hopefully everyone's had a chance to grab a sandwich. We're going to roll into uh, our next session. Um, I'm, I'm on a personal level, this means a lot to me uh, to introduce my friend Justin Aaron. Um, let me preface this by saying that without this man, it's probably impossible for this event to be happening. So please keep that in mind. Um, I met Justin uh, in 2015 when he was the curator, manager, founder of the Noepe Center for Literary Arts at Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. And suffice it to say, I went up there, and I've talked about this on the, on the 1455 site, um, I went up there and had a transformative experience for two weeks, interacting with other writers and seeing for the first time since academia what I had lost and forgotten about, which was the the inspiration and solidarity that exists among people that are serious about their craft, whatever their level of experience. Um, that winter, Justin gave me the gift that keeps giving by inviting me to come up there and be uh, the manager and writer in residence. So I spent a year up at Martha's Vineyard interacting with writers day in and day out. And I was taken over to the dark side and knew I needed to continue to do that. And so, um, I wanted to open up a center here that emulates the vision that Justin perfected. Uh, in addition to that influence and, and gratitude, I feel, Justin's always inspired me as, as a writer, and you'll hear for yourself, his uh, cultivation of a daily writing practice, his treatment of the work itself as sacred, uh, is ceaselessly inspiring to me. Uh, he's a man of integrity, uh, a, a gentle, uh, soft-spoken man whose poetry packs an unbelievable punch. Uh, I hope you all enjoy what he has to say. I'd like to let him say some words about craft. Um, and really, I'll step off the stage and let you do your thing. But Justin, thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Please and welcome my friend, Justin Aaron. Thank you, Sean. I'm incredibly proud um, and honored to know this man. Um, what he's pulling off here in a short time and what he's creating in this community is um, it's going to be a gift that's going to go on for generations. And uh, um, talk about carrying on legacy. I mean, it's, it's just really an honor to, uh, to, to know you and to see all this hard work that you have done. And to see, on, honestly, to see your dream, because we talked a lot about this over the years that we've known one another, um, the importance of creating community. And so when you see someone that you love, um, you see their dream coming true right before your eyes, it's a tremendous blessing. Um, to you, and you know it's a tremendous blessing to them. And so, um, thank you, Sean. Uh, the, the writer Annie Dillard says, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. You may have heard that quote. And to me, that, that quote really resonates as a writer, um, because I, I have been interested in that, especially the, the word spend. How am I spending my day? Because it seems to me it's very simple um, to spend my day in addition to being, as Sean mentioned, a founder of No FA Center. Um, I have, I also am the founder of um, Writing Workshop in Orvieto, Italy. I'm also a husband and a father, and I have a landscaping business. Um, I have two dogs that require my attention. So there are all these other things that require my time during the day. I could easily spend each day doing many things that do not apply to my creativity. And what I've found over the years um, is that uh, when I do not write, I become um, a very frustrated, uh, kind of impatient individual. Uh, and I use the word individual very consciously because I feel disconnected from many things, from other people, from myself, and from source, from something I can't really describe. Um, but when I'm writing daily, and when I'm exercising myself creatively, I often feel connected to people. I feel connected to my creativity, and I feel connected to something larger than myself. And it's that kind of feeling. Um, years ago, a friend of mine challenged me. Actually, he asked me a question, started asking me a question. And he said, you know, Justin, <clears throat> I've known you for a long time, and you, um, you write, um, but what if no one ever reads your work? What if you're never published? This is before I had books published. It was about 10 years ago. 
What if no one ever reads your work and what if you're never published? Would you still write? And I, yes, immediately, I would still write. And he said, well, they're great. Now the pressure's off. You know, you just need to write. So because it doesn't matter to you what the outcome is. And at that moment, that started for me what is my daily practice. I write every day. I don't always know what I'm writing about. I, uh, certainly what I write every day, um, a lot of it is um, not good. It's not going to become anything, but it is an exercise in communing with myself, in communing with, um, and sometimes it's just a complete dump of um, you know, things I'm feeling and thinking, but it has become a really, and Sean used the word sacred, it has become a sacred practice. The, the um, act of creativity has become something very sacred. And so I wanted to have, while we're having this lunch here, while you're eating, noshing away, um, if you have a pen and paper and you care to answer some of these questions for yourself, Selves, I thought it would be um, interesting to pose some questions to you for you to think about later. Um, first of all, it's very simple. Um, I will ask you the same question my friend asked me. If no one is ever going to see what you write, if you're never, if you were never published, will you still write? And maybe you're already published, so maybe you're, maybe you could apply that to the next thing. If nobody's ever going to read or nobody is going to publish what you're working on, now will you still write? So that's one simple question. Um, another question is, um, what is your relationship to writing? What is your relationship to writing? Why do you do it? What do you get from it? Another question is, um, what time of day is your most creative time of the day? This is a really, I think, is, it seems quite simple, but it's really worth thinking about. Because I realize my most creative time is 10 o'clock in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Why it's important to, um, at any time after this, like after 1 o'clock I'm ready for a nap. And then, um, and then, you know, the kids come home from school, and then it's dinner time, and then it's the evening, and the evenings just kind of get away from me, you know. Or by the time everything's settled in the evening, I'm too tired to have great creative ideas that I can follow through on. But I did realize that when I was going, and I have a job, so I'm going to work every day, and I realized, oh my gosh, I have my first brilliant idea. Oh, it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> Literally, it's like clockwork. And so I needed to figure out in my life how I could carve out time between 10 and 1, or even if it was 10 minutes between, you know, 10 minutes somewhere in that period, that I needed to be able to sit down, um, get myself quiet, and really pay attention to what's, what's happening. What ideas am I having? What feelings am I having? What am I, um, what's operating within me that needs to emerge? And so I was able to do that. Um, Again, after this friend of mine she kind of posed this question to me, the follow-up to that, which I didn't mention yet, is he then challenged me to write every day. And he said, think of someone you really don't want to give $100 to. And so I thought of that person immediately. Somebody came to mind. He said, now call that person up and ask them if they will hold that space for you. And if you don't write every day, if you fail to write one day, you have to give them $100. And I thought, that's great. And so I called this person up, and I asked him, and he was glad to take $100 from me. I think he thought, I'm surely going to make $100 on this guy. Um, and he, but this, this guy actually became a really great friend, because he held that space for me, and he would actually text me every day at the end of the day and say, did you write today? I mean, I think he wanted his $100, but over time, I think it really became, he was invested, literally invested in my success at that point. And so um, that was a really uh, amazing gift that he gave me as well, kind of. On the side. Um, but anyway, the importance of how we are spending our days creatively, we have to be able to carve out time from our busy lives to devote ourselves to something that we obviously all really love and we find it is exceedingly important. In fact, it's so important that we don't care whether anybody reads it or whether it's any, ever going to be published or we're going to make any money from it or we're going to get any acknowledgement for it. We have to do it. And so if we have to do it, 
why aren't we doing it? Well, we gotta take the kids to school, we gotta walk the dogs, we gotta cook dinner, we gotta do the laundry, we have to blah, 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 right? So, I guess I'm saying, find these times of our days that are really important to us, and make that the sacred 10 minutes. If you wrote 10 minutes a day, every day you write 70 minutes a week, and you can do the math from there, I'm not a math person, I'm a writer. So I, I won't. Um, 10 minutes. And I think you'll find as you start to carve out this time that that 10 minutes becomes 15, becomes a half an hour, becomes, and it becomes this kind of um, impregnable um, fortress that we've built around our work, right? Because at first I think you'll find, I find it very hard. I'm not, I mean, maybe you already do have a daily writing practice, but um, I think as we carve out this time and if we make it sacred that we find, um, uh, it's very difficult to allow other things to intrude upon it. We have just, um, we've kind of signaled to the universe that we are, we're here and we're serious and our intention is to work. And then the universe begins to work with us and we, um, uh, wonderful things can happen. So, um, it's a little difficult to put into words what happens when we enter into this dailiness with ourselves, um, say it's the 10 minutes, or say it grows into an hour or two hours, um, there's something really um, profound that begins to happen. Uh, not only are we exercising our creative muscles, and so when we, when we kind of sit down, we've, been, we've trained our bodies um, to, uh, and our minds, I think, to that now this is the time. We've arrived at our seats, and it's an amazing thing that starts to happen. We've now cultivated ourselves to kind of drop into that creative space. For me, it used to take, um, you know, it would take some time. It would take sometimes um, pages before I felt like I could get into the flow of my work. But I found that over kind of this practice, over the, uh, cultivating this practice, that it's almost a my body would know as I was kind of moving towards this, the page that it was entering into that a different space, a different a different thought pattern, you know. Um, and so by the time I would then get to the page, by the time I do get to the page, I've entered a different, I've entered that creative space almost immediately. Um, so that's another I think benefit of that creative work. Um, and also being consistent again with the time, if you can find a time that is working for you, to kind of try to be consistent with that. And see the way that your body and your mind um, can drop into that space when it's time to go, when it's time to, to start making work. Um, you know, I came, I came to this work because for years, for most of my life I wrote, and I was incredibly frustrated. Uh, as I mentioned before, I kind of feel I get impatient. I feel like I'm disconnected from things when I when I don't write. And I went for years uh, only writing when I felt inspired, which was um, not frequently. Maybe it was a couple of times a week, if that. Um, and you know, the funny thing is, is the more consistent I was in my work, and I thought this would be just the opposite. I thought if I'm writing, I'm going to run out of, and I'm going to run out of material. I'm not going to have anything to say. Um, and the most terrifying thing for a writer, I think, is that either blank page. Now, what do I say? Or that flashing, you know, cursor on the computer screen. Where do I start? Um, but I found the opposite to be true. I felt that I would empty myself each day creatively, and the next day I would come back and be filled again. And that was really an enlightening uh, moment for me because I felt this is a, what I thought was kind of creativity being scarce. I was finding that it was abundant. I couldn't exhaust it. I couldn't exhaust it. And I had spent years just, again, thinking, I, I could only write when I am inspired to write. I have to have something to say. Um, and so I became then changed as I've gotten you know into this daily practice. I mentioned the blank page or the flashing cursor on the screen. I kind of became fascinated with um, if I'm going to be spending a good portion of my days, like two, three hours a day, is what I was uh, doing at that point. Um, how do I break the silence of the page? And so what I do with my workshops, um, 
So they're really just, they're really prompts um, and discussions about how we get going, how we um, just, I feel like once we break that silence of the page, we're off and running. But how do we do that? How do we start? What do we have to say? And I just, I came up with dozens, hundreds of tricks uh, to kind of trick myself into beginning. And one thing I did, for example, was um, thank you. Thank you for dot, dot, dot. Uh, easy prompt. Um, I could just, now I already had something on the top of the page. All I would have to do is then say, um, Thank you for, and continue that sentence, and finish that, finish that sentence, and inevitably, there was so much more that began after that. And the thank you for might fall away, it might it was just scaffolding, that later, going back in revision, I might have found material for um, some greater work. And two, an example of that, I would like to read a poem from this book, A Strange Catechism, which came out in 2013. Um, the example is this poem, the scaffolding has follow, fallen away from this poem, but I wrote almost this entire book um, using the same prompt to start, which was initially this first poem. This is the first poem I wrote for the book. It's called Sunrise. It was originally, the prompt was on the first day of turning in the parking lot. And the idea was I was in Key West with my family, and I went to the grocery store and there was a woman standing in the parking lot turning counterclockwise. Standing in the, standing in the parking lot turning counterclockwise. The next day I went, um, I think I forgot, you know, whatever, I forgot, and I had to go back, and she was there again, standing in the par parking lot turning counterclockwise, and I thought, okay, well, what's this woman doing here? So I went home, and in my journal I wrote, on my first day of turning in the parking lot, and I got this poem. Um, what I had found with that prompt was that I could just come up with any day. I could tell you more about this lady, uh, this woman later, because she really became a muse for this book, um, which led to other things. But I found that this simple prompt, I could write anything. I could write on the 243rd day of turning in the parking lot, and suddenly I was writing. And it didn't matter. I could say anything. The sun came out, the birds chirped, the cricket you know, crossed my foot. It didn't matter. I was, I was working, and that was the important thing, because um, that's what I had always found most difficult to do, was to start. So I want to share this poem with you. It's called Sunrise. And the whole premise of, of this early poem, which I thought I would kind of continue with the book, was that we're all, like the butterfly effect, we all have a, you know, we're all doing something that is um, contributing kind of down the line to something else, like a hurricane. Um, so that was kind of the premise, which all of this has fallen away from the book, but the poem remained, and again, the, the prompt fell away, and this poem remained. And, um, but again, we don't have to know what we're working on. We just, I think, have to be working. Um, and we can figure the rest out later. So sunrise. The woman gesturing obscenely at the intersection of First and Main, who sleeps on a bench in the cemetery or in the doorway of her church, her blankets covered in bird melodies, is responsible for this morning's frost. And the clouds skirting the orange sky were dragged here by the man pulling a shopping cart full of empty bottles down the alley to his house. Someone shits in the street and snowdrops break through the ground. I'd like to meet the man who makes the sunrise and the person who lifts the tide laundering the earth. They must be strong. Water is so heavy and reluctant. It must be a mother in the barrio carrying her feverish child upstairs to bed. And keeping the cooking flame lit there where there is no food, two lovers in a field of sheets. What a gift they are giving, their forgiveness of one another bringing us the rain. So this book, um, uh, this book is really um, dear to me because uh, it was something written in this kind of consistency of a daily practice. Instead of these fits and starts um, that I had experienced previously, uh, I just really never could get any traction. I never really felt like um, uh, I was able to let, to kind of marinate in, marinate in ideas 
or in for poetry, you know, in music. Um, and so this book became a revelation because it was proof to me that this consistency uh, could lead to something for me uh, 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 that I could finish. And that had always been difficult for me. I'd come up with a bazillion ideas but never finish. Not always be able to get to the finish line. Um, but this, this kind of consistency, I think, allows us to, um, something, something happens where we never fully, I think, exit the work then. Um, you know, we, we finish our day of writing and we go about the rest of our life, but it's kind of, because we've been working it and working it, it's just, it's resonating. You know, it's resonating at all times. And so I find myself walking my dogs with these lines of poetry in my head then, you know, that I just was kind of working out and realizing that I was going about my day and these things were kind of working out, working themselves out until um, maybe I've been writing the same two, you know, the same couplet for um, weeks. And finally, click, you know, the music clicked. But I don't think that could have happened unless I had been um, consistent with um, living with it, and it living with me. Um, and again, I say, there's something about bringing our intention and our attention, this kind of consistency of bringing our attention and intention to our work that signals to something, I think, greater, or, or to our unconscious, or to the universe, or whatever you're comfortable calling it, to the muses, that you are, um, that you're, that you're there to work, and this aid begins to happen. It kind of lives with us, and it lives in us, and we begin to embody the work. And I think that's kind of how we flesh out the work. Um, I don't know. These are all ideas I just I toy with, and I'm talking a lot. And I actually wanted to ask you questions and just kind of open it up and um, see if you have a practice or if you have things that work for you. If you wanted to share with the room, like what. What works for you? How do you kind of keep working? Um, how do you spend your days as writers? So if anybody wants to chime in on that, yeah. Uh, how do you deal with uh, self-criticism, if you do at all? Oh, I'm really self-critical. <laughs> yeah. um, here's what I, I say to myself. There's no room in, when I'm making, no room for self-criticism. What's the point? I'm bringing something new. I'm bringing essentially a child, an infant, a newborn, a new thing into the world. I don't even know what it is, so why am I going to be critical of it? So I, I try to take the criticism out. Um, uh, I often give myself um, uh, times. So my creative time is 10 to 1. My really critical, analytical cr uh, editing time, different time of the day. So if I'm, say, working on making new work, which I usually am always making new work and editing old work that I'm kind of bringing into publication or trying to bring towards publication. Um, so I just kind of, I try to categorize those things. When I'm making, I'm not, I'm not that's not where I'm being critical. When I am crafting something and re revising, then, I'm, then I can be critical of it. I would put a different, you know, come at it with a different approach. Uh, I think it's important to be critical of our work, but um, not in the making of it. That we should just be able to uh, go as far as we can go with it and surprise ourselves and play. Play, yeah. Yeah, one of the things I thought would be very important for people to do, and this is probably an interesting thing about the panel, we've done a lot of time with our own writing. I think that we see more time also spent in doing other people's work. Mm -hmm. I know it's a parameter for that venue thing that could be really good emphasis on what you're doing. And we heard yesterday about your name the book now. This is part of the community, reading other people's work. But I think that if you try to do a book once a month or something, mm -hmm. as a community, as well as just as giving yourself the expense of time. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and certainly reading and thinking about other people's work is, is always gonna is always gonna help us grow as writers and thinkers. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So uh, I actually spoke about this yesterday or the day before, but uh, because we're on the subject, I'll mention it again. Um, my friend, the author, Neil Logan, told me when I was writing my very first book, The Mental Machine, that it's important to separate 
writing some editing, and he said the way that he thought of it is um, the writer weaves the cloth, just weaves the cloth, and then the tailor takes the cloth and makes the shirt. So I, I always, always kept that in mind when I read these. As soon as I see myself starting to criticize or edit, let it go. Write the wrong word, write the wrong sentence, just let it go, and then come back Yes. How do you organize the thousands and thousands of words that you read? <laughs> well, some of it is, uh, so for the last book that I wrote, I literally, I had thousands of pages of poetry, and, um, but a good six, seven hundred pages was not with tra trash, so that I could just get rid of. <laughs> and that's not to say it was garbage, I did say it was trash, but I do feel like the ruins of all of that material is what the book is built upon. I had to go through a lot of thinking, a lot of debt down, a lot of dead ends, um, you know, chase down ideas that just weren't working in order to write the material that the that the book rests on, really, that the book is the rest of the book is built upon. Yeah. So there's really nothing that is, um, I, but that doesn't really answer answer how do you sift through it. But I think as you kind of also as you do discover what you're writing, if you don't already know. That as as you, you discover it, then you, sh you you sharpen what doesn't you know belong. Those things kind of fall away naturally because you you know what you you know you know you know what you're working on and what kind of belongs to this to this book or to this moment of time that you're then you know writing about. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, so. Yeah. And shift work is so brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just messes with your system. Um, I don't. I don't know. You know, if your shift, if your schedule is shifting around, you know, how you kind of find. You might nominate it, but you might also. You might nominate that time of day. You might know it, but you might also have to not be able to build a schedule out around that. Um, what I have found works for me when I am. Um, just overloaded with things like that. It, again, it's just to make sure, I, even if I can find 10 minutes, but um, I used to commute uh, by train, for example, and uh, for a lot of times, I would be spending on my news feed or Facebook or whatever, and then I, at some point I was like, gosh, I have 15 minutes that I could be writing, and so I started giving myself a, pr a prompt where I would write a poem between each train stop. And I did this for a while, and I got some really wonderful material out of that. Again, a lot of the scaffolding fell away, but it was like this little project. You know, 15 minutes, I had this little project that I could work on. Um, and uh, I got a lot of material out of it, a lot. So that would be one way I would think, you know, how could we find something that is, um, maybe we have to walk from point A to point B every day. Maybe that's a point we could, you know, use, but maybe we could, re you know, we can all record on our phones. Maybe we could do it audio if we can't, you know, we can record ourselves speaking these things if, if we can't write them down. But um, I don't know. We just have to carve out those times, get up a little bit earlier, as hard as that is, and try to write for 10 minutes. But 10 minutes a day is, again, 70 minutes a week is on and on. It's, it's, it's something, which is better than nothing. I think I have to wrap it up. But um, thank you for listening, and again, I'll be here too, so if anybody wants to carry on the conversation, I'd be happy to talk with you. Thank you very much.